This is LXBN TV and I'm Colin O'Keefe. Today we are taking a look at the conclusion of the Allen Stanford trial. Stanford was convicted last week in a $7 billion Ponzi scheme. Joining me today is Stephen Burke, Washington, D.C. class action lawyer and former federal prosecutor. He authors The Corporate Observer, an excellent blog on corporate misconduct. Uh, starting off, Stephen, you know, for those who, who don't know, honestly, this case was a little bit off my radar coming in, but then I saw a lot of people talking about it. Uh, can you give us the background on Stanford and what he was convicted of? Yeah, uh, good morning, Colin. Um, yeah, Stanford was um, sort of number two in the rogue, uh, rogue's tales of uh, Ponzi schemers just behind Mr. Madoff. Um, he uh, put together what he called a bank when it really wasn't a bank. It was a Ponzi scheme, and he sold uh, certificates of deposit, which were, which were really just paper. Um, and he ran this all out of an operation in, in Antigua where he became quite a hero. He bought a cricket team. Um, and um, became a knight, I believe, in Antigua, in the uh, Caribbean. So he was quite a flamboyant guy. Um, sadly, though, he stole a lot of money, and it wasn't money from folks that were well-heeled like the Madoff investors. Huh. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just sad to watch, but yeah, living quite the life where he can just print pieces of money, sell those, and then move down to someplace else where he can be a hero. Um, but, but what was Stanford's defense here, and was he really the only one at fault? I know in these situations, oftentimes it doesn't just come down to, to one individual who messed up. No, that's absolutely right, Colin. I mean, it's hard to steal that much money by yourself. Um, you know, I was a big uh, fan with my sons of the Ocean's Eleven series, and it took, what, 10 or 15-man crew to steal $150 million. So $7 billion, you can't do it alone. Um, he had an organization um, he had banks, he had financial service companies helping him. Um, uh, interestingly, on the criminal side, he alone was the one that was convicted. Um, I, don't, I think his number two man was the guy who testified against him, will probably go to jail as well. But um, in terms of who was involved, um, you know, typically these guys will have a bank that they're working with, um, other financial services companies, um, but he's the only one that's going to take, uh, take the hit. Yeah, and isn't, isn't the bank that he was working with coming under a bit of scrutiny now? I'm not sure if it was from the Department of Justice or who, but I, I thought you mentioned that they had become under a bit of scrutiny as of late. No, you know, Colin, this is you know, sort of my take on a lot of these Ponzi schemes is the banks um, knew something or had to know something because the money came in and just went out and yeah. there really wasn't an investment. But as far as I know, the bank that he was working with is not under investigation. Um, uh, they should be probably, but they're not. Yeah, yeah, it's... It, it's interesting how those happens, how, how when these transactions can come in and out, but it doesn't, you know, raise any red flags. Um, and then finally, you know, now that Stanford has been convicted and he likely faces, you know, a life in prison for what he's done, you know, what relief do the victims get, if any? I know in these situations, it's it's not necessarily, you know, what you think they deserve. Yeah, unfortunately, well, I guess the good news for the uh, investors is there's a $300 million fund of seized assets. Um, uh, Mr. Stanford was quite a wheeler dealer. He had, uh, you know, jet airplanes, homes, and um, cash, and probably expensive wine and whatnot, and that all totaled up to about $300 million that the government has. So they'll take that $300 million and um, put together some sort of fund will the, where they will be able to distribute that to the victims of this fraud. Um, the problem is the victims are out approximately seven billion dollars. So um, uh, the money that's been recovered or been seized is about four percent of that. So um, if you assume that some people don't take the money, you know, um, maybe four or five percent out of um, out of out of out of the total. So they'll get something back, um, but it will obviously be a very very small amount. Yeah, you know, it's just a shame with these types of things. You know, people will get, somebody will make off with such a large amount of assets, large amount of money, and they only get such a, you know, a small percentage back because that's just, there's no other way to solve it. But Yeah, um, and in this situation, um, you know, these people were buying certificates of deposit, so they, they thought they were buying fairly conservative investments, right? It wasn't, you know, sort of some crazy, loopy kind of uh, hedge fund or something like that. It was... Uh, uh, a CD, which back in the day was uh, considered a very safe investment, but uh, not in this case. Yeah, it's it's just a shame. It's just a shame. Well, again, that was Stephen Burke of Burke Law and the excellent blog, The Corporate Observer. For more on this story, Stephen has a great series of posts on it. Be sure to check out thecorporateobserver.com. And, of course, you know we've grouped these all together in a tag, so search for it. 
Search for Alan Stanford, or yeah, Alan Stanford on lxbn.lexblog.com. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Colin.